And our speaker, speaker is William Rocktell from Wenatchee. Happy to have you with us. Thank you very much. I'm very happy to be here tonight, and we certainly enjoyed having your minister Milo over in Wenatchee in October for a conference we had there and got acquainted with him and really enjoyed speaking with him and visiting with him over there. And we were very happy when we understood there was to be a conference here and that uh, we would be able to have some fellowship and discussion again regarding the Word of God. I appreciated very much the remarks of the one who spoke before me tonight, especially his thoughts regarding the importance of the Word of God and the necessity that each of us has to study it, to find out what the Word has to teach us, and to follow our Savior Jesus, who is the way and the truth and the life. I'm sure all of us who believe the Bible believe that to be true. The title that I have tonight is a little bit of an ambitious title, What is the Gospel? And I realized after I chose that title that in a half hour it would be very difficult to answer that question in every detail. So I have basically chosen one of the details that I feel is very essential, although I certainly would agree that the things that were said in the, by the last speaker about those unities in Ephesians 4 are certainly essential to the gospel. Probably everyone who calls himself a Christian believes that gospel means good news and that the good news of the gospel centers on the Savior, Jesus Christ, and his message of salvation. In such a time as this in which we live now, which is described by the Apostle Paul in Galatians 1, verse 4, as, quote, the present evil age, the very word, salvation expresses hope and implies that there is a better day to come. Although there is some dispute about, among professing Christians as to what the gospel is and what the nature of salvation is and the means required to obtain salvation, there is no question that salvation promises hope joy, victory, and righteousness in the, oppo oppo the opposite of despair, misery, defeat, and sin. In short, the word gospel is a word expressing optimism, consistent with the concept of the word as meaning good news. <clears throat> The title, as I said, of my thoughts is, What is the Gospel? But our answer to that question will have important implications for the meaning of salvation and how to obtain it. Earlier I quoted from Galatians 1, 4, and I'm using the New International Version this evening. I have the King James here. I sometimes use one, sometimes the other in some of my thoughts and messages. Tonight I'm going to use primarily the NIV. But a few verses on in this chapter 1 of Galatians, the Apostle Paul writes to these brethren, beginning in verse 6, I am astonished that you are so quickly deserting the one who called you by the grace of Christ and are turning to a different gospel, which is really no gospel at all. Evidently, some people are throwing you into confusion and are trying to pervert the gospel of Christ. But even if we or an angel from heaven should preach a gospel other than the one we preach to you, let him be eternally condemned. As we've already said, so now I say again, if anyone is preaching to you a gospel other than what you accepted, let him be eternally condemned. 
Now, those are very strong words, obviously. Some of the strongest words Paul uses anywhere in his epistles. And yet, from these words, it is clear that there is only one true gospel. Now, there are many messages that down through the ages have claimed to be gospel and that men have called gospel or the gospel, as they still do. But for Paul, and I think for us, there should be, it should be true, that there is only one gospel and that all other messages that purport to be gospel are simply human inventions or human substitutes masquerading as the gospel. Whatever the gospel is, the Apostle Paul goes on to say something very interesting about it in the third chapter of this book of Galatians. I'd like to read verses 6 through 9. He's going to go back for a few moments to the Old Testament. And I really appreciate it, again, the thoughts of the one who spoke before me regarding the importance of looking at the Scriptures in their historical context, their theological context. That is very important. We talk about being New Testament Christians, and certainly we should be. But that does not exempt us from the responsibility of looking at all of God's Word, Old and New Testament alike, where the Old Testament gives us the background by which to understand much of what is said in the New. And so Paul reminds his Galatian brethren, verse 6, Consider Abraham. He believed God, and it was credited to him as righteousness. Understand, then, that those who believe are children of Abraham. The Scripture foresaw that God would justify the Gentiles by faith and announce the gospel in advance to Abraham. All nations will be blessed through you. So, those who have faith are blessed along with Abraham, the man of faith. Now, it is sometimes tempting for us to think that the gospel was something altogether new when the Lord Jesus appeared. But the Apostle Paul tells us that the gospel was announced in advance to Abraham some 2,000 years earlier than, than Jesus' birth. The gospel then in Paul's day was old as well as new. It reached far back in time to Father Abraham and, we might add, to God's promise made to Abraham. In fact, Paul concludes this same chapter 3 in Galatians with these words. He says, if you belong to Christ. Now we, we talk about being Christian and belonging to the Lord. And certainly we should be very concerned that that be true of us. If you belong to Christ, he says, then you are Abraham's seed, his descendants, and heirs according to the promise. Now those words, I think, are extremely important, especially when we realize that the gospel was, at least in part, preached to Abraham. That gospel, that good news, and Paul doesn't distinguish this now, he had already said in chapter 1, in effect, that there's only one gospel. And woe unto anyone who preaches another. And yet he says, the gospel was preached in advance to Abraham. And here he says, if you belong to Christ, then you are, quote, not only Abraham's seed, but heirs 
according to the promise. We might ask ourselves, what does Paul mean by these expressions, Abraham's seed? What does he mean by heirs? What does he mean by promise? What is he talking about? What is he concerned about in saying such things? What then would be the overall teaching of Scripture on these matters? In the book of Hebrews, also which was quoted uh, earlier in the sixth verse, but now I want to go a little further on this wonderful faith chapter, as we call it, the faith chapter. And I'd like to begin in verse 8. Because here again, our New Testament is going to tell us something about this Old Testament man of faith called Father Abraham. By faith, Abraham, when he was called to go to a place, he would later receive as his inheritance, obeyed and went. Even though me, he did not know where he was going. By faith, he made his home in the promised land, like a stranger in a foreign country. He lived in tents, as did Isaac and Jacob, who were heirs with him of the same promise. For he was looking forward to the city with foundation, whose architect and builder is God. Now, it's very interesting the way the writer of Hebrews some think it may have been Paul, we're not sure. The Bible does not really tell us. That he brings out again the thought of Abraham, a promise made to him, speaking of the heirs, Isaac and Jacob, who were heirs with him of the same promise. What was that promise, after all? First of all, we're told that Abraham was called to leave where he was. Of course, we know that he was from Ur of the Chaldees, Mesopotamia, Chaldea, it has a number of names, Babylonia, today it's called Iraq. And he was called, we're told, to go to a place which later on he was to receive as his inheritance. He was to be an heir of something, as was were also Isaac and Jacob later than Abraham, or after Abraham. We're told also in the same passage that when he got to that land, he lived there as a stranger, a foreigner, a sojourner. The land that, in fact, was promised to be his. The land here is called the promised land, or as the King James puts it, the land of promise a land which God was promising to him. I'd like to have you turn with me, if you would, in your Bible, to Genesis, the 12th chapter, which gives us the background of all of this as it is first described in the Scriptures. As Moses writes this in Genesis 12, he recounts that the Lord has said to Abram, leave your country, your people, and your father's household, and go to the land I will show you. I will make you unto a great nation, and I will bless you. I will make your name great, and you will be a blessing. I will bless those who bless you, and whoever curses you, I will curse. And all peoples on earth will be blessed through you. And then we're told that Abram left, left his homeland, he settled for a time in Haran. He took his wife Sarai, as she was called at that time, his nephew Lot, all their possessions. And they set out, we're told, for the land of Canaan. And they arrived there. And then we read later on that the Lord appeared to Abram in verse 7 and said, To your offspring I will give this land. The land here, of course, is called Canaan. Very definite spot on earth. And then in the 13th chapter, 
The Lord makes the promise even more detailed. Beginning in verse 14. It was after Lot and Abram separated. The Lord said to Abram, after Lot had parted from him, lift up your eyes from where you are and look north and south, east and west. All the land that you see I will give to you and your offspring, your seed, and can't say it in other places, forever. I will make your offspring like the dust of the earth, so that if anyone could count the dust, then your offspring would be counted, or could be counted. Go, walk through the length and breadth of the land, for I am giving it to you. Now, it does mention his offspring. It mentions his descendants. It says it will belong to your seed. Of course, we know that Abraham is the father of the Hebrew people, the Jew Jewish, the Israelitish people. According to the flesh, as Paul says in Romans. But I'd like you to notice that as this is described here in the scriptures, the promise of inheriting Canaan, an actual geographical entity on this planet Earth, is very clearly spelled out in concrete terms. Nothing mysterious, nothing allegorical, down to Earth. A promise made to Abraham and his seed, but especially I would call your attention here to the fact that it is made to Abraham personally himself. He says, I'm giving it to you, Abraham, and to your seed. He just distinguishes Abraham from his seed. And both are heirs of that land, he says. The question I want to ask this evening is, was that promise ever fulfilled? Let's ask ourselves that question and see if our scriptures answer it for us and what the implications of that answer might be for us as Christians. I'd like to go back again to Hebrews 11. <clears throat> we had read, you remember, from verses 8 to 10, where God had promised Abraham the land. He says it's a place you will later receive. And he lived there as a stranger, we put where he read, as in a foreign country. Then in verse 13, we read something very interesting. All these people, and he, he had just mentioned Abraham, Isaac, Jacob, Sarah, and some others earlier, were still living by faith when they died. They did not receive the things promised. They only saw them and welcomed them from a distance. And they admitted that they were aliens and strangers on earth, which could also be translated, by the way, in the land. Either way is all right, however, they're both true. They died, says the writer of Hebrews, without receiving what God had promised. Now, that immediately should cause us to wonder a little bit, maybe scratch our heads. God has said, I'm going to give it to you, Abraham. It's going to be yours. Immediately adds, practically immediately, that he died, along with others, not receiving what God had promised. Please turn back with me to the book of Acts a moment, to the seventh chapter. Here we have the wonderful sermon of Stephen, called often the first martyr, the one who was stoned for this marvelous message of faith. And he begins his sermon in this way, in verse 2, as he had been given, been charged with having stirred up false doctrine and false or division among the people. To this he replied, Brothers and fathers, listen to me. The God of glory appeared to our father Abraham while he was still in Mesopotamia, before he lived in Haran. Leave your country and your people, God said, and go to the land I will show you. So he left the land of the Chaldeans and settled in Haran. 
After the death of his father, God sent him to this land where you are now living. Notice how concrete that is. Remember Stephen spoke these words in Jerusalem. He was then taken out of the city where he was stoned. But he says, remember God brought him to this land where you are now dwelling. Now notice verse 5 carefully. He gave him, God gave him, no inheritance here. Not even a foot of ground. But God promised him that he and his descendants after him would possess the land. Even though at that time Abraham had no child. Now, here we have, it seems to me, a dilemma. God says to Abraham, I'm going to give you this land. But we already have seen, both in Hebrews and here in Acts, that we are told that he didn't get it. Not even a foot of ground did he inherit. Did God lie? Well, none of us can believe that if we believe in the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, and the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who we are told cannot lie. So we cannot believe that God lied to him. He said he would give it to him. God promised him that he would give it to him. In fact, Stephen says, but God promised. It reminded me when I read the way it's put in the NIV of my own experience as a father when my children would say, but Dad, you promised. You know, and they wanted me to, to give them what I said I would give them. Dad, you promised. And so it is said here, but God promised. But he didn't give it to him. What then is the key to this problem? And what connection does that have with the gospel? Well, we saw in in the book of Hebrews that the writer said he would later receive for an inheritance. It seems to me that is the key for, to this problem. But the question here arises, later, how much later? Later than when? Obviously later than his mortal lifetime because we read that he died not having received it. And of course, later than this present evil age, for Abraham has been dead and gone for almost 4,000 years, and he still has not inherited that land, not personally. Some of his offspring may have and lived there, but not Abraham himself. But God has a power that Abraham understood that made this not such a mystery after all. That very same 11th chapter of Hebrews, I think, gives us the key to that problem. Beginning in verse 17, right after we read that Abraham died in faith, not receiving, by faith, Abraham, when God tested him, offered Isaac as a sacrifice. He who had received the promises was about to sacrifice his one and only son. Even though God had said to him, it is through Isaac that your offspring will be reckoned. Abraham reasoned, now notice what he reasoned, that God could raise the dead. And, figuratively speaking, he did receive Isaac back from death. Now, of course, we all know the story that Abraham did not literally slay his son although he was willing to do so at the command of God. That's how faithful he was. But the writer assures us that Abraham understood at the same time that God could raise his son from death. That, it seems to me, helps us to understand this word later. And then when we realize what our Lord Jesus said, in the book of Mark, in the 12th chapter, about resurrection and the, the raising of the dead, it seems to me we can understand a little better 
how this promise to Abraham can be literally and personally fulfilled to him. I'm looking here at Mark 12, beginning in verse 24. This is the famous incident where Jesus was questioned by the Sadducees who did not believe in the resurrection. They believe that when you're dead, you're dead, and that's it. And they brought up a problem to Jesus that they thought made it very clear that there could be no such thing as resurrection. But notice the reply of Jesus in verse 24. Jesus replied, Are you not in error because you do not know the Scriptures or the power of God? When the dead rise, that's a future you'll notice, when this happens, they will neither marry nor be given in marriage. They will be like the angels in heaven. Now, about the dead rising, now that's the whole question. Do the dead rise in resurrection or do they not? Have you not read in the book of Moses in the account of the bush how God said to him, I am the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, and the God of Jacob. He is not the God of the dead, but of the living. You are badly mistaken. Now, I believe this passage has often been misunderstood. Jesus is not talking about a present consciousness of the dead. He's talking about the resurrection. When people rise from the dead. And that, of course, he is putting in the future here. And he says certain things will be true of the dead at that time. But he says he's not the God of the dead, but of the living. What does he mean by that? Well, I believe Scripture is its own best interpreter. And turning again, or turning now to the book of Romans, we find Abraham brought in again with regard to death and life and the fulfillment of promises. So I submit it's talking about a related or even a similar or same thing here. Romans 4, in verse 17. He had just said of Abraham, he is the father of us all, all believers, Christians as well as Jewish believers, Gentiles as well as Jewish believers. Verse 17. As it is written, I have made you a father of many nations. He is our father in the sight of God, in whom he believes, the God who gives life to the dead and calls things that are not as though they were. Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob were long dead when Jesus said this. But he is not the God of the dead, but of the living. Why? Because he calls things that are not as though they were, and he intends to raise Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob from the dead so that they may receive their promised inheritance, which is, as we have seen, the land of Canaan. But what does that all have to do with us? And we're getting very close to the end of my time here, but I must quickly hurry back to Galatians 3. This time I want to begin in verse 26 of Galatians 3. You are all sons of God through faith in Christ Jesus. We all stress this fact of faith in Jesus. If we want to be children of God, we have to believe in Christ. He had said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No man cometh unto the Father but by me. For all of you who were baptized into Christ have clothed yourself with, yourself with Christ. There is neither Jew nor Greek, slave nor free, male nor female, for you are all one in Christ Jesus. All of these things are precious to everyone who calls himself a Christian. These are part of the gospel reality. Sons of God through Christ. Baptism into the name of Jesus Christ for the remission of sin. All of these things in the unity of the body, no Jew or Gentile, male or female, bond or free, all one in Christ. But notice how it again concludes the chapter. If you belong to Christ, then you are Abraham's seed and heirs according to the promise. The promise. That's 
the strange thing we see occurring over and over again in Scripture, the promise. What promise? The Apostle Paul in Romans 4, we'll return there just for a moment, I must hurry on here quickly. <clears throat> Verse 13. It was not through law that Abraham and his offspring received the promise who are Abraham's offspring. In this chapter and in Galatians, they are the sons of God through Jesus Christ. His offspring that he would be the heir of the world. The heir of the world. But through the righteousness that comes by faith. Heir of the world. What does he mean by that? Heir of the world. Had not the Savior said in the wonderful Beatitudes, these are all promises that are ultimately fulfilled in the future. They have a present application, certainly. But ultimately, they are eschatological. They have to do with the day when the, those who mourn now will rejoice. And those who are now persecuted for righteousness' sake are to be rewarded. But notice among those things Jesus says in verse 5, Blessed are the meek, for they shall inherit the earth. I submit to you that throughout Scripture we are promised in the Gospel, in the promises made to Abraham and to all the faithful, the inheritance of the earth. Not the earth as it now is, no. There will be great changes. But it will be this earth. It will be the earth where Mesopotamia was. The earth where Haran was. The earth finally where Canaan was and is. I find no way to get around those promises, nor do I feel we should want to. A great deal is said in Christian circles about heaven. Heaven is our home, and when we all get to heaven, and all of those things that I find over and over again in Scripture, and as the speaker before me, I invite you, I urge you to test it by the Word of God. Don't believe it because I say so. But I have found over and over again in Scripture that the promise to the faithful is to inherit this earth, a glorified earth, a changed earth, but nevertheless, the earth. And that, I submit to you, is a very important part in answering the question, what is? It seems a little strange to me that you left out a couple of verses there in Hebrews 11 uh, where it talks about having not received what was promised there in Hebrews 11, 13. But in, in picking up the word, verse 14, it says, For people who speak thus make it clear they're seeking a homeland. If they had been thinking of that land from which they had gone out, they would have had opportunity to return. But as it is, they desire a better country that is a heavenly one. Therefore, God is not ashamed to be called their God, for he has prepared for them a, a city. And I find it hard to reconcile here when it talks about their looking beyond the earthly to a heavenly country. In replying to that, I would say we have to let the context which the writer has already laid down, show us what country he's talking about and what land. I find that the word heavenly in the scriptures does not necessarily refer to where anything is, but to the nature of that thing, whatever it happens to be. We speak of the kingdom of heaven, and yet the kingdom of heaven is not necessarily a kingdom in heaven, is it? And we have a, a number of places 
where heavenly does not necessarily mean that it is in heaven, but, for example, even this city, which is in other places called the heavenly Jerusalem, is called that, I believe, because as the writer John tells us in Revelation 21, as he describes that city, he says it is the new Jerusalem which comes down from God out of heaven. That's Revelation 21, uh, verse 2. So it's heavenly because it, its source is from heaven and the nature of it is certainly heavenly. But that does not tell us where it is because in the context in Hebrews 11, the writer has already told us that the country that Abraham was to receive was that land in which he dwelt as a stranger and which he would later receive but never had up to this point. Uh, well, if if this is uh, if this is where we are, we as Abraham's seed are going to stay or be is on earth. What is heaven for? Christ said that He was going to prepare us a place, and that in His Father's house there were many mansions. So, what is the purpose of heaven then? If if heaven isn't really a place that we are going to? In John 14, where the Lord gave that promise, <clears throat> He says. Right after he mentions in my father's house are many mansions, he's going to prepare a place. Then he says, and if I go and prepare a place for you, I will come again and receive you unto myself, that where I am, there ye may be also. Now, in order to answer your question, we have to find in Scripture where the Lord will be when he comes again. In uh, Matthew 25, 31, he says, when the Son of Man shall come in glory and all the holy angels with him, then shall he sit upon the throne of his glory. My understanding of that throne is that it will be a throne on this earth. In Jerusalem, the scripture says, and Jeremiah 3 tells us that, and also Isaiah 2 and other places, and he will be, if he comes again, he's coming to the earth. He says, if I go away, I'm coming back. In the scriptures, I have found, and I, I just invite you to check this out, the Father's house, let me just give you an example of how that term is used. In 1 Timothy 3, 15, But if I carry long that thou mayest know how thou oughtest to behave thyself, I'm reading from King James here, the others have the same role, in the house of God, which is the church of the living God, the pillar and ground of the truth. I do not find that how the house of God is necessarily heaven, but rather the house of God is here called the church. In God's house, there are many abiding places, in God's family, in his household, in his church. Christ has gone to prepare each one of us our particular place in that family, in that household. And when he comes again, we will receive that particular place which he has prepared for us. But it seems to me this passage in John 14 has often been read without reading verse 3. Verse 2 is read as though it promises going to heaven, where verse 3 shows us, in fact, the Lord is coming again, that we might receive what he has prepared for us. I have a question. If that is the case, 1 Corinthians 15, 24 says, Then come at the end, when Christ will deliver up the kingdom to God the Father. So this teaches me, if I believe correctly, that when Christ comes to this earth, he's coming for the purpose of judging his people. Then he will give up his kingdom. He, will, he is not coming to rule on this earth. Because in 1 Thessalonians chapter 4 and verse 17, there it teaches me that we're going to meet him in the air. There is no scripture that says that Christ is coming back to this earth, set up a little kingdom, and then rule over his people. Uh, and then another question I would like to put to you is uh, Joshua 23 and 14. There God said 
all the land he had promised those people, he gave it to them. Also in Joshua 21, 43 to 45, all the land that God promised Abraham, he gave it to his people. There was anything that he had promised them that he did not give them. And I'm just wondering, how do we uh, reconcile this with the New Testament? Because the book tells me that God is not a man that he should lie. He doesn't have to repent for anything he says. And if God says he gave them the land, I believe he gave it to them. Also, Genesis 15 and 18 teaches that God did give them that land. My reply would be that to your final question, starting with the last one first, that the uh, physical descendants of Abraham certainly did, and I would certainly agree with you that that is the case. That's why I made a distinction between Abraham himself and these physical descendants of his called the people of Israel. They certainly did. But we've already seen that Scripture clearly states that God did not fulfill his promise to Abraham to give him that land. Otherwise, we pit Scripture against Scripture and we have a contradiction, which we do not believe there is in Scripture. Also in 1 Corinthians 15, which you asked about, in verse 23, the resurrection is placed at Christ's coming. The word then is the Greek word that means next or afterwards. It's, it's not at this very point at his coming, but the next thing that, that the writer, that Paul details here is the turning over of the kingdom. Now, it would take a while for me to answer you what I believe the time element that lapses between verses 23 and 24. I do believe there's a lapse there, but I would like to go to your question about 1 Thessalonians 4. <clears throat> this, of course, is the famous chapter or passage about the resurrection and the Lord Jesus coming, descending from heaven. He descends from heaven. He's no longer in heaven at this point in time. We read that we are to meet him in the air. He is coming. We go to meet him in the air. I'd like to just give you an example of how this word meet is used in the Scripture. Again, Scripture should interpret Scripture. Please turn with me to Acts 28. We find that the Apostle Paul was on his way to Rome. He had, you know, as you remember, voyaged toward Rome. He'd had a shipwreck. But he finally got to land on the Italian boot, a city called Puteoli in verse 13, modern Italian city called Puzzuoli. When he got there, there were several brethren that he found there, Christians, who wanted him to stay there with him, and they did for a while. And then it says they went toward Rome. They left that place, went on toward Rome. If you look at a map of Italy, you'll see that they journeyed north over land toward Rome. From thence, when the brethren heard of us, from Rome, that is, the brethren heard he was coming, they came to meet us as far as Appii Forum and the three taverns, whom, when Paul saw, he thanked God and took courage. And when we came to Rome, why am I using this? Because the same idea and the related word in the Greek root is the same. The brethren in Rome heard that Paul was coming. They went out to meet him. Did Paul take them back with him to Palestine? That's where he was coming from originally. No. He, they came to meet him. They heard he was coming. They conducted him to Rome, where he was going. This is exactly the, the imagery that Paul uses here. And it's not just my word. and It's, it's the word of many well-known Greek commentators on the language used here. We are going out to meet him as he comes. He's not going to take us off somewhere. He's coming here. We have scripture after scripture to show that he's coming. And Zechariah 14 says that his feet shall stand in that day on the Mount of Olives. So he will come. I think my time is up. Thank you very much for your questions and your patience. Thank you.
I hate to quit when it's just getting interesting. 